After being attacked by MJF last night on AEW Dynamite, signs point that William Regal is set to return to WWE in the near future. We've got the latest on a possible return to the company. Plus, Stephanie McMahon lords the success of the White Rabbit campaign, suggesting it led to a 20% boost in viewership of WWE programming. Sasha Banks is spotted at an NBA game. We have the update on the success of Survivor Series. We also have an update on the ratings for this week's edition of NXT. Brian Kendrick was back at Survivor Series, and we now have the reason as to why. An update on some WrestleMania events as well. Plus, what is the latest when it comes to bonus payments to WWE superstars? Hey guys, welcome back to Wrestling News 365. Hope everyone is doing very well. As always, there are plenty of news stories to get into in the world of WWE. And perhaps the biggest one right now is actually involving a current AEW talent who is about to be headed back to WWE if reports are uh, to be believed. Of course, last night on AEW Dynamite, William Regal was attacked from behind by the new AEW World Champion Maxwell Jacob Friedman in a shocking turn of events. And many people speculated, along with John Moxley the prior week, telling Regal to go away and never show his face once again in AEW with Triple H also teasing William Regal on social media before Survivor Series War Games and the attack and stretcher job that Regal did last night. A lot of people have been speculating, does this mean that Regal is going to be headed back to WWE? Well, if reports are to be believed, he is. Now, this comes in stark contrast to some of the other reports we had previously heard. Dave Meltzer had previously put out there that William Regal was signed to a one-year contract that was then disputed and corrected to that he signed a three-year contract. But now, the latest report from multiple outlets and significant outlets as well is that Regal could be and is speculated to be heading back to WWE. So the first report comes from Mike Johnson of PW Insider, who is reporting that all signs are that William Regal will be World Wrestling Entertainment bound shortly. Although PW Insider have heard nothing official from the company, there have been rumblings within WWE WWE as of late about Regal returning in a backstage role. That would mean Regal would be exiting AEW where it certainly appeared that he was written out of storylines last night on Dynamite having been attacked by AEW World Champion MJF. Now, of course, when it comes to Regal's past in WWE, he was there for, gosh, over 20 years before being released um, earlier this year, rather. In 2014, Regal began focusing primarily on WWE's developmental, appearing on screen as an announcer and as the NXT general manager. But behind the scenes... He had risen into one of Paul Levesque's trusted lieutenants, eventually being given the official title of WWE Director of Talent Development and Head of Global Recruiting. Regal was regularly traveling to major independent events to help scout talents and bring them into the WWE fold. He was a major sounding board for talents inside and outside of WWE and was pretty much considered to have a job for life until Vince McMahon dismantled the Paul Levesque black and gold vision of NXT earlier this year, late last year. Now, he he was released Regal along with many other Lovex staffers in January of 2022 and then Regal moved to AEW. He debuted in March of this year, playing off his real life past as a mentor to Brian Danielson and John Moxley. This led to the official formation of the Blackpool Combat Club, which eventually added Wheeler Utah and Claudio Castagnoli. Regal though, turned on Moxley to set up MGF's AEW title victory at full gear several weeks ago. But when it comes to WWE, Vince McMahon's resignation from WWE and and the return of Paul Levesque to power. Now Paul Levesque, of course, is the WWE Chief Content Creation Officer. And because of that, he controls WWE Creative. He also controls uh, the, the talent relations as well. So not only does he sign uh, the talent contracts, but he also writes the TV shows too. We have seen several in recent weeks and months, several of Paul Levesque's uh, team come back to the company. Names like Gabe Sapolsky, Road Dog Brian James, uh, Ryan Katz as well has been another that was part of the NXT team that is now back in the company. With Paul Levesque's return to power, obviously the stage is set for this likely return as Regal was long considered as one of Levesque's top consigliaries. Now, we'll have to wait until there is an official confirmation on this, but that came from Mike Johnson of PW Insider and it subsequently also been backed up by Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful Select. They are writing that William Regal could already be on his way out of All Elite Wrestling. Fightful Select is reporting that talent is of the belief that William Regal's AEW deal could be up in December of this year. This was also being speculated at this past weekend at the WrestleCade event in which several AEW talent were at. Now Fightful are saying they'll work out to find more, but there is absolutely WWE interest. 
and bringing Regal back whenever his deal is done. Again, once again, backing up the report by PW Insider. And this is really getting quite fascinating, also quite convoluted, but it's also getting very, very fascinating, it must be said, because we are now hearing so much or have heard over the last week 10 days, two weeks, we have heard so much conflicting information when it comes to William Regal. Again, just look at this timeline of what's going on at the moment. So you've got <laughs> William Regal last week being told on Dynamite by John Moxley, uh, go away, never show your face around here again, and never come back. And people started to think, well, that was strange. And that sounded like someone basically being told to leave television and that sounded like someone being written out. Someone that can't do physicality because, of course, William Regal's got four plates in his neck and um, he's also got, you know, had two bleeds on the brain. So he's got significant injuries and he can't be touched. He can't do any physicality. So a lot of people assume that actually that sounds a lot like uh, a situation in which someone's being written out of television that can't physically be, be written out of television. That's what it felt like at the time. And of course, the moment, the moment Triple H came back into power, it was always a discussion point of, well, Regal, if he can get out of his AEW contract, he'll come back. I've said it before. If William Regal was a free agent today, if he hadn't signed with AEW, he would already be back in WWE. And I said this at the time too, and this isn't me sitting here going, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so. It's just logic. It just makes sense. The moment Triple H assumed power in the company, he was looking to bring back his team. He was looking to bring back his team that was in NXT. Now, some of those were quicker than others because some people were still free agents. Gabe Sapolsky was a free agent. Uh, Road Dog was was a free agent. Ryan Katz was a free agent. He could immediately sign those people up in addition to bringing back the talents that were still free agents and were part of the success of NXT. He was going to bring them back. Others, it wasn't as simple as that. Others, they were with AEW. They'd signed contracts. People like William Regal, people like Adam Cole, people like Isaiah Swerve Scott, etc, etc, etc. In an ideal world, Triple H would bring them all back because he's worked for them before and people like William Regal, it's a no-brainer. Again, he was with the company for over 20 years and most importantly, he's one of Triple H's best friends. And he was Triple H's first real hire when Triple H started to oversee developmental in sort of 2011, 2012. William Regal was the first guy that he told, OK, you're going to be my guy. You're going to be the guy that recruits. You're going to be the guy that scouts. You're going to be the guy that's there on tryouts, etc., etc. You're going to be involved in all of that. So it was only natural that Triple H would speak to William Regal and say, hey, how long you signed to? Can you get out your contract? If you could, would you want to come back? And of course, William, Re William Regal didn't want to leave WWE. He got fired. So whilst he could be enjoying his time, and I'm sure he's enjoyed his time in AEW, WWE's his home, and he'll believe that. Not only is WWE his home, it's not like he's coming back to work for Vince McMahon. He's coming back to work with his best friend or one of his best friends, one of his closest closest comrades in, in professional wrestling and someone he's worked alongside with for years. I mean, it was pretty much a decade until he got fired earlier this year. So of course he would want to go back. Now, again, I think there has to be some scrutiny on... The reporting that's been put out there, because uh, just look, look at how many different scenarios we've heard at this point. Initially, Meltzer puts out there, he signed to a one-year deal. So even if he is signed to a one-year deal, he made his debut in March, so that would imply he's probably not going to leave AEW until March, April. But then, very quickly, the next day, Meltzer puts out a correction going, no, 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 it's not a one-year deal, it's actually a three-year deal. He said he signed a three-year deal. And again, to me, that felt, felt like someone picked up the phone and said, it's not one years, it's three years. Now... You've got talent that's talking to other journalists like Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful saying, well, we think it's actually up in December. And given the way that Regal's been booked on television in the last two weeks, it feels like it might be December. If the week prior where John Moxley was saying, you know, don't show your face and all that kind of stuff, felt like he was being written off, he was definitely written off of television last night. No doubt about it. And I spoke about it earlier in the AEW news video I did today saying that it felt the logic wasn't there. It felt like an illogical situation. You've just had this guy turn on John Moxley in the Blackpool Combat Club, and now MGF turns on him. And I understand the the way they're trying to phrase it or show it is well. Don't make a deal with the devil. And you know this guy wronged MGF in the past. Now MGF, he's just playing the long game. He played the long game. He's got him. But also, like, what did it do for Moxley? Because Moxley said, "Don't show your face around here." But William Regal did show his face. And Moxie did nothing. Clearly, they're setting up MGF versus Brian Danielson, but 
It felt like last night maybe they sped up plans that they had for Regal, Moxley, well, not Moxley, Regal, MJF, and Danielson. And again, the reason why they sped things up is because Regal's on his way out. Now, you could argue, how is he able to get out of his contract after nine months? Unless he has an out clause, and that is possible, he could have an out clause. John Moxley had one in his initial AEW contract when he signed back in 2019. He was able to leave after a year. But it would be really surprising for William Regal to have an out clause after nine months. That seems particularly odd to me. I mean, I guess it's not technically nine months. I mean, when did he make his debut? I don't know, it's nine months. He made his debut in March, and it's December now, so that would be nine months. So... I, I, I would be surprised by that unless he his out clauses of you know, January 1st of, of next year, maybe. I'm not sure. And if he always did have an out clause in his contract at a certain time, why would AEW be so insistent on using him on television knowing he's always going to go back to WWE, especially the moment Triple H assumed control in July of this year? So it's a very bizarre situation, but ultimately all signs point to William Regal going back to WWE. And you know, the shame is involved in it. Not that William Regal's going back because he's whatever he wants to do. And if he's happy, then that's that's fine. But I've enjoyed seeing William Regal on my television set every single week as a talent. And it feels like we're not going to see that anymore. And yeah, he might go back to NXT and he might be the NXT general manager. He might take that authority role away from Shawn Michaels or something like that. And that's fine, but... I don't know. I enjoyed having Regal on commentary and seeing William Regal make his entrance with Brian Danielson and John Moxley and cutting these promos and the back and forth of Excalibur. And again, I enjoyed it, but it's, it feels inevitable that William Regal is headed back to work with Paul Levesque. So, of course, if we get any updates about that, we'll talk about that here on the channel. I'm sure it's going to be a developing story. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below about Regal's possible WWE return. Let's go back and talk about the White Rabbit. Remember that? Yes, the White Rabbit. We spent weeks breaking it down, and it's no secret that the return of Bray Wyatt had a great deal of hype from fans of wrestling. However, according to WWE co-CEO Stephanie McMahon during a recent talk at the Wells Fargo 2022 TM, MT Summit, uh, the storyline resulted in a significant boost in company's uh, audience, saying, quote, we were bringing back one of our biggest stars named Bray Wyatt, McMahon said. We used a multimedia approach and hired a horror writer to come in and really help us craft this narrative so our fans were engaged. McMahon talked about one of the mysterious White Rabbit QR codes that led to a series of numbers that could have been interpreted either as a date or a time code, 0923. The co-CEO revealed that on the following episode of WWE SmackDown, viewership around 9.23pm shot up by 20%. Quote, it's strategies like that that really do work, McMahon continued. The audience today is different. They're growing, they're evolving. Some people want to have a laid back approach or experience, and that's great. But a lot of people really want to engage deeply and have fun and have misleads and misdirections. Wyatt, of course, made his return at Extreme Rules in October, following weeks of build up both on WWE television and online. Fans were absorbed by the White Rabbit teases, which can be credited to WWE's new director of long term creative, Rob Fee. The horror writer McMahon alluded to. Since being brought back into the fold, Wyatt has been engaged in a feud against LA Knight, though Wyatt has yet to compete in an actual match. The storyline has seen Wyatt struggling with different aspects of his personality, including his old persona known as The Fiend. It's unclear where the story is headed next, but fans are sure to be on for a wild ride. Um, I've seen some people starting to sour a little bit on Bray Wyatt on social media, saying it's getting dull, it's getting repetitive. I, I see it kind of the opposite. I I'm glad that they're starting to do something and he's starting to have interactions with people, so I, I, I like that and I think the LA Knight stuff is really really good um but it, it's, it's factually accurate that episode of Smackdown 923 it was Braun Strowman versus I think it was Otis and they actually peaked at something like 3 million viewers for Smackdown in the segments insane <laughs> but that was because of the work they put in for for Bray Wyatt and I suppose it's two ways to look at it it's to show that yes that that strategy absolutely worked it spiked viewers but did you keep them and you didn't keep them because they tuned in and they went, oh, he's not there. Okay, I'll, uh, maybe I'm not going to tune in again. I don't know. So you can look at it a couple of ways, but certainly it was a huge success for WWE. And we are still seeing the QR stuff. We are still seeing the number mysteries. The thing is, it's just everyone loves a whodunit. Everyone loves a mystery. Everyone loves to, you know, Easter eggs and all that kind of stuff, hidden details. There are YouTube channels that literally that's all they do is Easter eggs and hidden details uh, in Marvel films, DC films, other films. 
it's awesome. And uh, I think WWE needs to do more of it, but not be too heavy handed with it at the same time. Sasha Banks was spotted yesterday at an NBA game. We still have no clue what's going on with her. Uh, the maybe, maybe not WWE star status has been up in the air ever since she and former women's tag team champion Naomi walked out of an episode of Raw back in May. And the situation has only got murkier as time has gone on. Meanwhile, Banks, she's just continued to live her life, which seems to include attending, uh, attending NBA games and sitting courtside. Bleacher Report captured footage last night of the game between the Miami Heat and the Boston Celtics, which showed Banks on camera, waving to the fans back at home. Hailing from Boston, Banks was surely happy with the result of the game, which saw the Celtics win uh, 134 to 121 on the back of a whopping 49 points and 11 rebounds from Celtic star Jason Tatum. Um, she was recently spotted trading with Juventud Guerrero, um, in Mexico, um, there have been, again, chants and speculation on where she could go. She's teased both WWE and AEW. As I said, honestly, I don't expect to see her back on WWE TV now until next year. Possibly at the Rumble. There's a possibility she could go to AEW. It's possibly she could go to Japan. You know, we, we still don't really know. But she was spotted last night at the NBA game, just, again, living her life. Survivor Series War Games was a change of pace this year, going to War Games instead of Brand Supremacy, and WWE sent out a memo to executives regarding Survivor Series numbers and uh, adding more detail to this. And according to Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful Select, WWE has been optimistic internally about the performance of Survivor Series War Games, even though there is some conflicting information depending on how you look at it. Fightful Select is reporting that WWE executives received a memo on November 30 detailing the following about the pay-per-view. It is claimed it's the most most viewed Survivor Series on record, jumping up 46% versus the 2021 edition of the show, which would be astronomical. That's largely due to the Peacock streaming service. It's the best in-venue merchandise sales in the event's history, up 20% from last year's Survivor Series. The live gate was the highest ever in Boston and for Survivor Series, which Triple H noted at the post-show press conference. Fan enjoyment rating popped 48% versus last year. We aren't really sure how this is measured internally within WWE or the metrics associated, so so if we get out on that, we'll talk about it here. It's also touted that social media video views were up over last year with the TikTok of Roman Reigns sending Sami Zayn into the match, uh, garnering 13 million views alone. We'll obviously find out more about these numbers, what they mean long term, but certainly they're good numbers and there was more buzz going into the show. However, People are looking at this a different way because obviously, look, those numbers were also great. But at the same time, Dave Meltzer is reporting on the latest edition of Wrestling Observer Radio that pay-per-view buys for the show are 35% lower than what they were for October's Extreme Rules events and are currently the lowest in WWE history. Furthermore, SummerSlam at the end of July reportedly did triple the pay-per-view buys of Survivor Series War Games. Now, obviously, as Meltzer points out, pay-per-view buys compared to previous years don't mean much as most people are now watching on Peacock and the WWE Network. But some people are suggesting that they're still relevant. However, we'll have to wait and, we'll have to wait and see. Google searches, though, weren't at the level expected for a major show. That's worth pointing out. Meltzer noted, quote, right now it's slightly lower than Crown Jewel in pay-per-view buys, which is the lowest pay-per-view show in the history of the company, which it means something and it doesn't mean something. It means something as far as in comparison to all... Uh, uh, the other shows this year. Yes, it means something because the situation's exactly alike, but when you compare it to 10 years ago, of course, there's no comparison. And the number is relatively small no matter what, uh, but this was, it's right now slightly behind Crown Jewel, so as of today, it's the lowest in history. It will undoubtedly by tomorrow, because it's so close, be ahead of Crown Jewel, but it's 35% below Extreme Rules. But this was a major event. The Google searches were not at the level of a major show. I know that the live gate was very good, and a lot of people watched it on Peacock, but the general public in interest level in this show is down and another thing showed that was on Monday for the rating for Raw. Unlike after Extreme Rules with Bray Wyatt, they got one of the biggest numbers of the year. Basically, the gist is that this wasn't as anticipated as Extreme Rules, not even close or any other of the big shows. SummerSlam was huge. SummerSlam did about triple the pay-per-view buys of Survivor Series, so it's a low number and across the board, when you look at the interest levels and everything like that, you can see that. It was a good show, but the interest level was not there compared to many of the pay-per-views this year, including the one not considered big four events. I think that's harsh. I do think that's harsh that Matsu is saying that because I think he's just taking out um, modern ways of looking at it. I think pay-per-view pay buys that he can say, well, they're lower than SummerSlam, but at the same time, 
you know, people don't have the money to buy pay-per-views at the moment, but they might have the money to pay for, for a streaming service, which they can watch other things, but just ignoring that. You know, t times are tough financially. Now's the time where people don't have, people don't have to go, okay, I, I can watch Peacock, but actually, you know what? I'll get some friends around and I'll buy it on, on pay-per-view or something like that. No, they'll watch it on Peacock because it's cheaper. That's taking that mindset out of it. You know, as I mentioned, it was the most viewed Survivor Series on record, jumping up nearly 50% from last year. So that laps the drop off that they've seen in pay for you. So clearly, in my mind's eye, those people that were watching on pay for you have just shifted over to Peacock, and that's what NBC Universal and WWE want. And I mentioned it was the most, it's the highest gate, the most attended show. In view merchandise sales are up 20%. Yes, the Google searches might have been low, but at the same time, they're saying they got more social media views than they have previously. So I think it's a very, very strong statement to say, oh, there wasn't that much interest in the show. I think I just think I just don't think that's accurate, to be honest with you. We've got the ratings for this week's edition of NXT. According to Showbuzz Daily, Tuesday night's show was watched by 644,000 viewers, which is up from 624,000 the previous week. Though throughout November, NXT viewership has remained steady between 620 to 670,000 viewers. Meanwhile, the all-important uh, 1849 demographic, this week's episode did a 0.13 rating, marginally up from last week's 0.12. Additionally, Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics also revealed that NXT came in at number 35 among cable originals in the 1849 key demo. It should be noted that NXT was once again up against the NBA basketball, which took a substantial 0.47 key share of the demographic too. So NXT kind of settling into that range of, as I mentioned, mentioned between sort of six to seven hundred thousand viewers and it will continue to sit there i think for the remainder of the year brian kendrick was back in wwe as a producer this past weekend despite his controversial comments earlier this year or the surfacing of these controversial comments earlier this year he produced alongside jason jordan the match between uh, smackdown women's champion ronda rousey and shotzi a match that was panned actually as well uh, but during the latest edition of wrestling observer radio dave mouser provided an update on the former cruiserweight champion's involvement at survivor series war games noting that it was Rousey herself who requested that her original pro wrestling trainer produce the match quote what happened was Ronda Rousey Brian Kendrick was Ronda Rousey's original wrestling trainer and she suggested she asked for him to be brought in for her match with Shotzi so he was in on Saturday and it was not a hire you could say it was a tryout I wouldn't say it was it wasn't a tryout but it really wasn't like a normal tryout it was more Ronda had asked for him to help produce Jason Jordan also produced it but she asked for Brian to be brought in so they brought him in Meltzer then added that Kendrick hasn't been rehired by the company as far as he's aware, although that still could change. So it was Ronda Rousey that brought him in to help improve the match, and the match didn't improve one bit, and I think that speaks volumes. Let's talk about WrestleMania. There's been an update on some possible WrestleMania events for next year. Um, according to a new report from WrestleVotes on social media, WWE is looking at holding more shows throughout WrestleMania weekend that are similar to The Undertaker's One Dead Man shows. According to WWE's description, the shows feature the phenom in an intimate setting, sharing never-before-heard stories about his Hall of Fame career and taking questions from the fan, fans in attendance. WrestleVotes noted that two names that have been discussed for hosting these kind of shows on WrestleMania weekend are Chris Stratus and Stone Cold Steve Austin. However, when it comes to Austin, of course, he's been heavily linked and rumored to be making an in-ring return at WrestleMania next year. So if he's going to have time for a one-man show, I doubt it. Trish Stratus, though, that could be interesting. Finally, we have an update on how WWE pays their talent. Uh, backstage news has emerged on WWE's bonus payments to its stars. It seems that WWE isn't flashing the cash when it comes to bonuses at the moment. As per Dave Meltzer speaking on the latest Wrestling Observer Radio, most paychecks at WWE you are not being topped up with bonus payments. He said, quote, when you're in WWE now, basically you're making, you sign a contract for a million dollars, just say you're making a million dollars. There's not a Saudi bonus. There's not a pay-per-view bonus. There might be if you're Roman Reigns. The super merch sale guys probably would get more, but most of the guys, that's not the case. Most people are making what the contract says right now, which again, take that with a pinch of salt massively because Yes, you could say, well, they're not making bonus payments, but now people have the, the biggest contracts you know, in professional wrestling history at the moment. So they make their downside guarantee. If they do more house shows, they'll probably make more money. They have merch um, rights too that they make money off if they sell a load of merch. And don't get me wrong, if they work the Saudi shows, they get money. I know Dave Meltzer can say they don't, but they do because they make so much money. So I, I, again, take that one with a pinch of salt. But there you go, guys. That's the latest WWE news for you. Be sure to smash a like on the like button. Be sure to subscribe, bottom right-hand corner. Let me know your thoughts on today's WWE news stories in the comment section below, and I'll speak for you again very, very soon. 
Hey guys, thank you for watching, listening, streaming, or however you come across this video today. Be sure to click on the video on the right there to watch our next video, or click the bottom there to subscribe, or the bottom right-hand corner. Thank you very much, and I'll speak to you again very soon.